Good morning. Welcome to this ministry of Pidcoke United Methodist Church. We want to invite you to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time for this short time for us to be together. We're separated by cause, because of the social distancing that we're all required to do, but we try to do this in order to bring some encouragement and some help to those around us, especially for those of us that, that are used to being together and can't be. But please join us. Share this on, uh, on your Facebook feed or YouTube. Uh, like us on Facebook. Follow us on YouTube. And uh, help us to spread this word that we're trying to share with our community and with the world. Join me for a, more, a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for this time to be together. We thank you that this, through this technology that we're able to reach out to one another and stay in contact with each other. We thank you that we can take your message and share it with friends and family and relatives and people around the world through this miracle of technology. Bless this time, we pray, Lord. Let it be to your honor and to your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In just a moment, you're going to see a short video by a group called the Skit Guys. The Skit Guys are two pastors who started many years ago doing videos that are able to assist in worship and in sharing the message of the gospel and encouraging Christians wherever they, wherever they play. This morning, we're going to be reading, you're going to be seeing a video about Thomas. Our Bible text this morning comes out of Acts chapter, out of John chapter 20, where Thomas is the, one of the main characters. We all know him as Doubting Thomas. But what did that feel like from Thomas's viewpoint? Take just a couple of minutes and listen as we share with you this video called Thomas. It's hard to be judged for one mistake, but it's what I'll be remembered for, I guess. I wasn't always the doubter. That's not who I am. I have a zeal for Jesus. I always have. When Lazarus died, no one wanted to return to Bethany with Jesus. The atmosphere there was volatile and dangerous. Jesus said he'd show us his glory. I assumed we'd all die there. Still, I'm the one who said, let's go. But then, then came this room. At the time, none of us understood as we sat at that table. This is my body? This is my blood? He raised the dead. He, he cast out demons even. What could he possibly mean? I didn't doubt it when they told me he was dead. But how can you not doubt someone coming back to life? Some didn't doubt. But for me, it was harder. Maybe it was just that I didn't want to be disappointed. Many came after me who believed without seeing what I saw. Jesus called them blessed. Yes, I touched the place of the nails, the hole in his side. Such definitive proof that I cried out, my Lord, my God. But that wasn't the only amazing thing. The Almighty One, he came back for me. He didn't want to leave me behind in my doubt. He says, I'm worth that, and I'll follow him anywhere for the rest of my life.
I want to share with you a passage of scripture from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold, the forgi withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and put my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Believe is the key word in the Gospel of John. Many say that love is the key word, but Without faith, and that's really what we're talking about when we say believe, love just becomes an exercise in sentiment, can easily be turned aside, can easily become uh, wasted in some way. When faith, But when faith in Christ is ours, our love becomes the expression of that faith as we believe Him and follow and, com and believe His command to love one another. Here in John chapter 20, we see crucial evidence that challenges our willingness to believe. Jesus has risen from the dead. Really? Science tells us that this, 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 that this is impossible. And yet here it is, raised up like a signpost, clear and unmistakable. We must choose. Do we believe or not? Like those first disciples, we find ourselves wanting to believe, but feeling a bit gun-shy because we don't want to be ridiculed as wild-eyed mystics. After all, didn't Mark Twain define faith as believing what you know ain't so? But you know, it's a different matter when there are eyewitnesses' accounts. And, it's, and that's exactly what we have here in John 20. Mary and the other woman, women found an empty tomb and reported it to Peter and the other disciples. Peter and John ran to the tomb, found what had been related to them, and walked away shaking their heads because they couldn't figure out what had happened. It's impossible to tell which without more evidence. But then Mary actually saw Jesus and talked with him and returned to the disciples to tell them, I have seen the Lord, and give them the message he had given her to take to them. And then it was the evening of the first day. The doors were locked out of fear that the authorities would come and drag this little band of disciples away just as they'd done to Jesus. But suddenly the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume, a light that came from everywhere, drove shadows from the room. That's the way Don Francisco put it in his classic Easter ballad, He's Alive. There was Jesus standing in the middle of the disciples, greeting them with that standard Middle Eastern greeting, Peace be with you, showing them his hands and his side to calm their fears that what they saw was merely an apparition, a ghost. So here's a solid piece of evidence. We don't know how many were in that upper room that evening, but all of the gospel writers report the same event, albeit from slightly different perspectives, as eyewitness accounts usually are. But by making their reports, by making those reports, they're at least worth considering. But some still will not believe. This is understandable. Not even all the apostles believed. Thomas was not there on that first evening. We don't know why, but he wasn't. And I don't suppose the reason matters now. When the others told Thomas that they had seen the Lord, he was incredulous. He just shook his head. I'm not going to believe that. 
Today's skeptics would have been proud of him. Not willing to accept the accounts of the other disciples, he would insist that except he put his fingers into the nail scars, thrust his hand into Jesus' side, that he wouldn't believe that he'd appeared to the other disciples. Maybe he thought their testimony was a product of mass hysterical hallucination, as some call it. In God we trust, all others bring data would have been a good motto for Thomas. But Jesus was out to make believers of all of those who'd walked with him. He would give them all the proof they needed. Now, eight days later, Jesus once again crashed the disciples' party and stood among them with the greeting again, peace be with you. He calmed the others and then turned his attention to Thomas alone. Here are my hands, Thomas. See the places where the nails were driven through? Touch these wounds if you'd like. Here, here's my side. Put your hand into the place where the spear was thrust in and where blood and water ran out, proving that I was indeed dead. And now, Thomas, drop this insistence on physical proof. You have it now, so believe. Thomas' confession, my Lord and my God, should speak volumes to all of us. Faced with incontrovertible tr evidence, Thomas relented of his skepticism and put his trust in the impossible, for he had seen the impossible. It's popular these days to talk about teachable moments. Well, this is one of those. You have believed because you've seen, Thomas, Jesus said. And then, as Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, uh, one of the most eloquent Bible, Bible expositionists I've ever heard, said, there fell from his lips his last beatitude. This blessing is one we can claim today as successors to those first disciples who believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, Jesus said. Campbell's exposition of this moment has gripped me since the first time I read it almost four decades ago. The eyes of the risen Christ were turned from Thomas and the group, and looking down the running ages, he saw the host of those who should believe in him, never having seen him, and his last beatitude came from the ages for all the sacramental host that make up the church of God. We've not seen his hands or his side. We've not heard the sound of his voice giving the blessing of peace to calm our fears. We've not physically felt the stir of his breath as he breathes upon us and blesses us with the wind of the Holy Spirit. But we've believed anyway. Jesus, or rather John, shows us the crux of the matter as he closes this chapter. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the clarion call that beckons to us who believe by, per by merit of the evidence that's presented. We can't demand more, for that's all there is. We cannot demand other proofs, for no other proofs are given. Matthew Henry, the 17th century commentator, wrote of these verses, we need not ask why they were not all written or why not more than these or other than these. Had this history been a mere human composition, it had been swelled with multitudes of depositions and affidavits to prove the contested truth of Christ's resurrection. But being a divine history, the penmen write with a noble security, sufficient to convince all those who are willing to be taught and to condemn those that were ob obstinate in their unbelief. And if this satisfy not, more would not. Our faith doesn't eliminate questions or doubts. To believe is to acknowledge that there are unanswered questions, facts that cannot be proved to those who demand more and different evidence. We're called to believe even as we wrestle with our doubts, trusting that the answers will come in due time, some on this side of eternity, eternity some on the other. It's as the Apostle Peter wrote, Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Are you among those who believed because of these things? If you're not, you can be this morning. Simply put your trust in what is written and believe. If you're a believer, you can take this same message to those who believe if they only hear it for the, who will believe if they only hear it for themselves from someone who truly believes the message themselves. I want to thank you for being with us this morning. Now let's pray. Lord, thank you 
Thank you for the truth that we find in your word. Thank you that we can believe being able to see the Bible as trustworthy, knowing through the testimony of the Holy Spirit that these things are written by your hand and given to us so that we may believe. Father, may we share that faith with others and may others come to know you, even though they, just like us, they've not seen you, yet they know that what they've heard about you is true and that they can trust you and follow you. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now stay with us for just a minute longer as I share another short video with you. Thank you and God bless you. Living with uncertainty can take its toll. The normal day-to-day -day is replaced with fear, worry, doubt. When our normal is disrupted, our surroundings begin to feel weak, foundations begin to rattle, our lives become disoriented. As time goes on, we begin to lose sight of the one constant on our journey, Jesus. The fear is consuming, the worry draining, the doubt painful. Even in our darkest moments, when the last thread of hope has unraveled from our being, we must dwell on truth. We must remember, no matter what is happening around us, God is still sovereign. Today, let us dwell on the truth of Easter. The stone has been rolled away. The grave has been rendered powerless. Death has transformed to life. In our fear, He is still risen. In our worry, He is still victorious. In our doubt, He is still alive. When everything seems hopeless, the hope of Easter remains. <laughs>